I'd like to start out by thanking you for taking the time to tune in and also to Sages for making all this happen during an incredibly challenging time. I think this talk is particularly relevant in the current environment. If you're anything like me, you're seeing more and more patients with chronic smoldering diverticular disease who have been sitting at home trying to tough it out during the pandemic. I have no relevant financial disclosures to this talk, but I am a consultant for Medeticus. So I personally find diverticular disease fascinating. The differences in the presentations, the technical complexity of the operations, and the profound effect that surgery can have on patients' quality of life. Now, while patients with various presentations are interesting, perhaps the most challenging to manage, certainly from a decision-making standpoint, is the patient with smoldering diverticulitis. And that's the topic I would like to discuss today. So patients with smoldering diverticulitis can present along a wide spectrum of severity and chronicity. Some cases are obvious, while some are much more nuanced. Dr. Schaefer will discuss the pathophysiology behind smoldering diverticulitis in her talk, and so I'm not going to rehash that here. I would like to focus more on the clinical presentation and management of smoldering diverticulitis. So what is smoldering diverticulitis? And it, it turns out that is a more difficult question to answer than one might think. Depending on the severity of the attack, recovery times following an episode of acute diverticulitis will vary. In most cases, symptoms certainly resolve within 90 days of an attack. However, a subset of patients, which can include up to 30 to 50% of patients, depending on how proactive you are in querying those patients, can have persistent low-grade symptoms. Those symptoms can include left lower quadrant pain, cramping, constipation, bloating, and anorexia, and oftentimes these go unrecognized. This is what many refer to as smoldering diverticulitis. This also becomes important when trying to define recurrent versus persistent disease. And you'll find that as you review the literature, there really is significant overlap in these definitions following an episode of acute diverticulitis. And this is where actually talking to the patient using sound clinical judgment is so important when trying to decide whether or not that patient needs surgery. Now, much has changed in the management of diverticulitis over time with a rational philosophical shift towards non-operative management beginning in the late 90s. Prior to this time, a lot of fairly normal colons were being removed unnecessarily based on the old adage of recommending surgery after two episodes of uncomplicated diverticulitis. In 2006, ASCRS published practice parameters relaxing the recommendation for surgery with uncomplicated disease, recommending instead that the decision be made on a case-by-case -case basis. There have been several studies suggesting that since that time, the number of elective resections has potentially declined, seemingly without an increase in the number of emergent or urgent resections. And while the data demonstrate this shift has not been associated with increases in emergent surgery for life-threatening sepsis, there are relatively few data on patient-centered outcomes and quality of life. At times, I wonder if the pendulum may have swung too far in favor of non-operative management. It is not uncommon to see a patient that was initially managed successfully for diverticulitis present to my clinic months later, malnourished with signs of chronic smoldering disease. And while there is no doubt that surgery was overutilized in the past, um, it is important to remember that clearly there are still indications for surgery, and the patient with smoldering diverticulitis will nearly always benefit from resection. Case in point, I recently had a patient present to my clinic, 85 years old, who had had diverticulitis for approximately 15 years with one attack per year. However, she'd ha begun to have increasing episodes in the last six months and had been admitted three times over that time period. These were all uncomplicated attacks. Most recently, she had been discharged to a skilled facility on antibiotics. 
And so when she came to my clinic, she was in a wheelchair with a pick line and antibiotics hanging. She continued to complain of diffuse pain and intermittent nausea, which prevented her from eating. She was miserable. Now, this is obviously a difficult situation, and there are several different options here depending on the overall health of the patient. Although she was elderly and ill from six months of smoldering inflammation, she had previously been quite healthy, and so I thought she would tolerate a resection, which is what I did. In these cases, I always give it a try laparoscopically, but it's certainly not uncommon to have to convert in this scenario, as there generally is significant fibrosis. In addition, the small bowel is usually quite involved as well, as was the case here. I find ureteral stents to be very helpful in a case like this. And I usually start by trying to peel the diseased colon off the sidewall and the bladder to medialize the colon. I then usually staple the colon proximally where it's soft, and then I use an energy device to take the mesentery close to the colon to avoid the ureter as long as there's no concern for cancer. Alternatively, though, sometimes it can be very helpful uh, to get under the IMA, uh, divide it, and to get into the retrorectal space, and that way you can lift the diseased colon off of the retroperitoneum. For this particular patient, I performed a resection and a primary anastomosis. However, you know, given her age and all she'd been through, she was certainly at high risk for leak, and so I wanted to divert her. I was worried about giving an 85-year-old an ileostomy, so I actually diverted her with a transverse loop colostomy. And she recovered really well, and I'm getting ready to reverse her colostomy uh, next week. Now, it's difficult to know the incidence of smoldering diverticulitis it is, as it has not been well-defined, and thus it's really not been well-studied. The group at Mayo perhaps said it best when they published on their experience in operating on patients for uncomplicated diverticulitis. Out of nearly 1,000 patients, nearly 10% had chronic smoldering symptoms, which they defined as symptoms of left lower quadrant pain and inflammation that does not improve or re-exacerbates for at least three months duration. And similar to other studies, they found that surgery in these patients was associated with more significant gains in quality of life metrics than patients without smoldering disease. It's interesting to look at some of the large prospective antibiotic trials in uncomplicated diverticulitis for the presence of persistent symptoms following resolution of the acute episode. As we have heard, uh, this trial randomized patients to observation versus antibiotics for uncomplicated disease and found no difference in the rates of recovery. The median time to resolution of symptoms was 14 days. However, more than a third of these patients experienced persistent symptoms at one and two years following their acute episode. Most common complaints were constipation, cramps, and painful defecation. It can really be quite challenging to know what to do with these patients that have more subtle persistent low-grade symptoms. It's fairly obvious that the patient I presented earlier who is so profoundly sick and malnourished and has been in and out of the hospital for three months needs an operation. However, the patients with low-grade symptoms can be uh, much more difficult to sort out. Many of these patients will come with a label of IBS when in actuality their underlying chronic inflammation is the etiology of their symptoms. Here is another case I had to uh, illustrate that point. So this is a 61-year-old woman that presented to my office as a self-referral for chronic abdominal pain for the past three years. She carried a diagnosis of IBS, and, but had also been treated by her PCP on and off for diverticulitis over that time as an outpatient. She'd been actually explored by a surgeon in the past with an intention of performing a sigmoid colectomy. During that operation, the patient had numerous adhesions of the small bowel to the sigmoid colon. The surgeon took these down laparoscopically, but felt the colon looked normal when it was exposed and so elected not to take out the sigmoid colon. That was over a year ago. The patient continued to have abdominal pain, which was worse with meals and nausea. She also had alternating constipation and diarrhea. I must admit that I was initially fairly hesitant that I could help her with surgery, 
However, I decided to get a CAT scan, uh, given that she had not had one in quite some time to see what it looked like. And here you can see the classic findings of chronic smoldering diverticulitis. The sigmoid colon is torturous. There is subtle thickening, which the radiologists do not always comment on, or they may say it's due to peristalsis. In this patient's case, um, her proximal colon was also dilated to suggest she had a low-grade uh, obstruction. After seeing this scan, I operated on her and her colon was an absolute mess, um, but she feels incredible now with resolution of her chronic symptoms. Perhaps the best guidance we have on management of this type of patient comes from the DIRECT trial, which was a multi-center randomized trial um, that randomized 109 patients with either persistent abdominal complaints, which you can see defined here after a single attack, or recurrent diverticulitis, defined as three or more attacks in two years, to either conservative management or sigmoid uh, colectomy. Uh, this study is interesting in that it focused specifically on patient reported outcomes with a health-related quality of life primary endpoint. You can see the uh, scores up to five years out were significantly higher in the surgery group. And furthermore, 23% of the patients that were initially assigned to the conservative group crossed over to surgery due to persistent symptoms. The authors concluded that elective laparoscopic resection was associated with better quality of life than conservative management in patients with recurrent disease or excuse me, persisting abdominal complaints after a single episode of diverticulitis. So in conclusion, persistent abdominal complaints are common in the setting of uncomplicated diverticulitis, and a fair number of these patients actually have smoldering ongoing inflammation. For that reason, it's important to follow the patients as a significant number of them will develop these ongoing system, symptoms which can be settled and misinterpreted. Ultimately, management relies on sound clinical judgment from carefully listening to the patient, followed by an open and honest dialogue as to the risks and benefits of surgery. Additionally, high quality prospective trials with patient-centered outcomes are needed to address this important topic and guide clinical decision-making. Thank you so much for listening and feel free to contact me anytime with any questions or concerns.